Uh, to our session uh, of the all party group on coronavirus um, on long COVID. Um, so this is a important week uh, for the all party group. We're hosting uh, a, a debate, a backbench business debate on the floor of the house on Thursday. Um, and the purpose of this session today is to brief our fellow parliamentarians on long COVID, a uh, disease that has uh, been growing in understanding um, we had our very first session on this actually back in August when it was very little understood um, and uh, we have had a lot of change and movement since then and as an all-party group we feel it's really important to be able to hear first-hand experiences of those who are living with the condition uh, and that's what we're going to be focusing on in the first 45 minutes at which point I will pass over to Caroline Lucas MP who will uh, continue to chair the second half which is with uh, professors um, who will be able to talk more uh, about uh, the medical profession's response to long COVID. So I'll start by introducing our first panel um, and it's a real delight. Thank you all for coming uh, and speaking to us today. Um, all three of our panelists uh, are living with long COVID and I know that one of the symptoms of that is very often tiredness um, and so I thank you uh, in particular for taking the time to be with us today. Um, we have Dr Natalie McDermott um, who's a clinical doctor sub-specialising in paediatric infectious diseases in the NHS and has also had significant experience in medical response to disaster and epidemic situations in Africa and Asia. So welcome Natalie, it's wonderful to have you with us. Um, we also have Grant Jones who's an advanced pharmacist specialising in HIV and home care at Kumtaf Morganog University Health Board in Wales. Uh, Grant is also living with long COVID. Welcome, Grant. Uh, and uh, we also have Lynn Yata, who's an anaesthetist who previously worked in an ICU in Wales. And Lynn also lives with long COVID. So welcome to you all. Um, and what I thought I'd start by asking um, is, in turn, um, if you might just explain your story. Uh, how did it start? And uh, where are you now? Uh, and how is it going? So perhaps, uh, Natalie, if we can start with you. Uh, thank you uh, for this opportunity to speak with you. Um, so I was working at Great Ormond Street in March when I was exposed to a colleague who uh, had COVID in an office uh, that we were sharing and I became unwell a few days later. I actually fully recovered from that episode and went back to work after 10 days uh, and then was working at the, on the COVID ward at, at Great Ormond Street in May. And at the end of May, I became infected again, although having said that, I've never tested positive for the virus, uh, but I had all of the symptoms and I had all of the symptoms all over again. And at the end of that time, uh, I developed uh, neuropathic pain, so nerve pain in my feet um, and uh, slight weakness in my legs. Um, it wasn't really clear what was going on at the time, but I couldn't walk very well. Um, so I had an MRI scan. Uh, which didn't really show very much, but over the summer and particularly then in September, I had a significant deterioration uh, and they, the neurologists believe that COVID has somehow damaged my spinal cord, but it's unclear exactly how. Uh, and now I can only walk about 200 metres without some form of assistance. I can walk a bit further with crutches, um, but the... Uh, damage has affected my bladder and bowel as well. So I get recurrent urinary tract infections. Um, and uh, I also get a lot of pain in my arms and I'm getting weakness in my grip now as well. Um, so that's my story at the moment. Thank you very much. And, and thank you for sharing that. It sounds very trying. Um, uh, Grant, uh, how about you? How, how, tell us your story, Mr. So, um, yeah, again, thank you for inviting me to be a part of this today. Um, so I'm Gannett, like I said, 30 years of age. Um, I initially became unwell um, over Easter weekend, um, having worked on the COVID positive wards um, and just a general feeling of dehydration, lethargicness, tiredness, um, pins and needles on the upper half of my body. Um, after 10 days, began to feel better, um, returned to work after my isolation period. Um, Felt okay. My chest was um, still quite tight and laboured breathing, but nothing that wouldn't stop me from helping out. Um, and then in July, I had intense stomach pain whilst in work, um, with my GP referring me to A&E with suspected appendicitis. Um, the bloods and x-rays coming back inconclusive. Um, and then exactly a week later, I had chronic diarrhoea and abdominal pain, which would last seven, eight hours a day at one point. And 
this lasted for 14, 15 weeks, um, still to the point now where I experience four to five loose motions a day. Um, the pain is still there as a background pain. Um, does get more trying on times than others. Um, but I've also been left with um, like the brain fog that people explain um, where I can't seem to recall the most basic of words or phrases or I put mugs in the fridge when I go to make it go to make a cup of tea. Um, I've got tinnitus in my one year, um, which is quite distracting when trying to communicate with others. Um, palpitations at rest, which is quite painful um, to the point of not knowing whether to go to a knee with a quite sharp stabbing chest pain. Um, and yeah, to be honest, that's, that's my story really. So I'm still ongoing and waiting for the test to kind of understand my ongoing symptoms. Thank you very much um, for that. And Lynn, how about you? How, how are you? And what's your story? Thank you too for inviting me today. It's, it's a real honor to be here. Um, so yes, I'm a junior anesthetist in South Wales and I initially developed COVID in mid-March after a stint of on calls. Um, and I got shortness of breath and a dry cough and a flu-like illness that put me to bed. Um, and then a week into that illness, I also developed sinusitis. Um, but I managed at home and after about two weeks, um, I thought I had recovered. Um, so I was back to work and I was pretty much well all throughout April. And then at the start of May, I crashed deep into severe long COVID. Wow. Um, so at the start of my long COVID, um, even just taking a couple of steps would make me feel absolutely horrendous. It felt as if my whole body was just filled with lead, but at the same time it had this sort of painful and burning sensation. Um, and it also made my heart rate just shoot through the roof. And I had painful pins and needles throughout my arms and legs, and I got recurrent sinusitis. And the more I tried to do anything, the worse all of these symptoms got. Um, so it would lead to what we call setbacks. So after having done um, anything at all, anything as basic as having a shower or cooking food for myself, um, I would become even worse. So this left me bed bound then for many months. And then I also had, similar to what uh, Geraint was explaining, the brain fog. Um, it sort of feels like a thick cloud that just fills the brain um, and I just stopped being able to think. Um, and then I also had short-term memory issues um, and word finding difficulties. And I couldn't tolerate stimulations. Even listening to some soft music was just too much. So I spent a lot of time during those first few months when I was the sickest, just sort of staring into thin air. Um, and then after about three months into the long COVID, sort of towards the end of July, I started developing symptoms of pericarditis, so inflammation of the lining around my heart. Um, and now today I still struggle a lot with chest pains and pins and needles and excessively fast heart rates and muscle aches and brain fog. But thankfully I'm a lot improved compared to um, at the start of everything. And prior to this, um, I was very fit and active. Um, so outside of work, I'm a coastal skipper and I'm very outdoorsy. So I've hiked all around the world um, and I would do martial arts several times a week or go to the gym if I didn't make that and cycling along the South Wales coast. Um, and now I'm only able to walk maybe a few hundred meters. So, yeah. Oh, thank you for sharing that. And sa sadly, a very common story that we've been hearing at the all party group, um, but not one I think the public has totally taken on board as a possible consequence of, of what's happening right now. If I could quickly just follow up to ask, um, and Lynn, you've described how your symptoms are getting, have changed over time and some are getting slightly better, but you're still left with quite difficult ones. Um, could I just ask Natalie and, and Grant, your symptoms, have they also been morphing? And are they generally better now than before or have they sort of stabilized um, just to give us a sense of the trajectory of how this has affected you? Uh, mine at the moment are continuing to get worse. So my neurological function is getting worse and I've got quite a lot of spasticity in my legs now. Thank you. Um, and myself, my, like I said, my chronic diarrhea has kind of subsided at the moment, but just as you find you're getting over something, there's something else. It's like for the past three or four weeks, I've had really painful palpitations. Um, the brain fog, again, has eased slightly, but just as you think you're, you're getting better, there's just something else, really. And it's just hard to know when you are better or when you're recovering or when you can expect the next turn, really. Thanks very much. Um, Caroline Lucas. 
Thank you, Leila, and thank you to everyone for sharing those stories. They're so they're so shocking just to hear the severity of what you're living with. So thank you for sharing that. I wanted to ask you how how it impacts in terms of your um, work life. I mean, I, I don't know if any of you are still able to work, whether or not your illness goes into remission for a while, which means you can maybe work for a while and then maybe you can't. And obviously you all work in, in, in health care or, or you, you have done it. And maybe that means employers are more sympathetic to the situation than perhaps in other areas by Napoli's face. Maybe that's not the case, but maybe I could start with you, Napoli, just if you could say a little bit about how this has impacted on, on work. Um, yeah, so I um, was off clinical work for three months in the summer after my episode being infected in May. Um, and then from September, I have been back in my academic role. So in my academic role, I can work from home. And so I do a reduced number of hours, but I do several hours a day uh, academically. Um, I don't know how I'll go back to clinical work at the moment. Um, I have one and one year and three months left of training to do to become a consultant. And um, they are currently trying to work out how to do that. They want me to do virtual clinics from March. Um, so we'll see how that goes. But um, yeah, there will need to be quite significant modifications in place for me to be able to be on the wards. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know what that looks like at the moment. Thank you. Um, Dr. Yerta. <laughs> So I'm, as a junior anaesthetist, all my work is clinical, so I haven't been able to work at all since I became sick. I'm just physically not able to, and then also the brain fog just wouldn't have made it safe, even if I would have been able to. And, and have you been able to get the support that you need, you know, in, in terms of, of sickness benefits and, and everything, has that part of it worked as well as it could do? Yeah, so I'm very fortunate to have very supportive seniors um, and thankfully then under NHS employer guidance for um, COVID sick leave, I'm still retaining my salary. Um, so I haven't had any financial worries as of yet. And, and Geraint Jones. So from July to September, I was able to work from home, um, even with the abdominal pain and diarrhea, just out of stubbornness, to be honest, and just a desire to kind of want to keep on going, really. Um, but to be honest, I woke up one morning in September and I just thought, how long can I live like this? How long can I sustain this for? Um, and I've been off work since really undergoing quite a number of different investigations and in a few different clinical trials. Um, and we can't seem to determine the cause for all my multiple and ongoing symptoms, really. Um, I'm awaiting urgent referrals to ENT, neurology, cardiology. Um, but again, there's, there's obviously such a backlog that it's quite difficult to understand who is clinically urgent at the moment. Um, and to be honest, I don't know how I've even got the physical or mental capacity to, to be even safe to practice as a pharmacist at the moment. Um, which is unfortunate because I, I love my job and I want to get back to helping my colleagues during these difficult times really, but I just, I just physically can't do it at the moment, which I'm just, yeah, it's just hard. Yeah, it's just so hard. Yeah. And, and, and within that, have you been able to get the support that you need in, in terms of, of just getting by for the moment? Um, so initially it was difficult, obviously, because of everything um, just being quite new and quite novel with the illness. Um, it's very difficult to say what is COVID, what is not. Um, and I found it really difficult to find support, really, from like clinicians um, and other sufferers, really, because there wasn't, at the time, July, there wasn't much information out there regarding long COVID and post-COVID illness and long COVID. So it was kind of a, a bit of an unknown grey area, to be honest. Um, Fortunately, I think the evidence and the guidance has seen that these symptoms are due to COVID. Um, and yeah, thankfully my employer has said that, yeah, I can maintain my, my financial um, sort of package at the moment. But again, it's for how long that's sustainable. I don't know how long I'm going to be un unwell for. Um, I'd like to think I could go back to work tomorrow, but it's just kind of a long drawn out illness, it seems like. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a, a quick question for you all, and um, I, I don't know if it's easier if just one answers or if your experiences are all different, um, but we're becoming increasingly aware of other people um, who have this, and I think there's one Facebook group that has 30,000 people in it. Um, when did you first become aware that it wasn't just you and that there were other people who were 
uh, also suffering from what is now being described as as long COVID. Um, what's your experience of that? Lynn, um, when did you first find other people? So I was really fortunate in that I came across one of Professor Paul Garner's blogs in the BMJ at a really early stage in my illness. And reading that was an absolute light bulb moment, you know, just realizing that he was describing pretty much what I was going through too. Um, so then straight after that, I posted um, on Facebook and then was contacted by um, some old acquaintances who also had long COVID. And then it kind of snowballed from there and I found several different Facebook groups and various support, um, which was absolutely amazing, a bit of a lifesaver because this is, can be such an incredibly lonely illness um, when you don't have the support, especially um, if people around you don't know about it or sort of misunderstanding around the illness. Thank you. And um, Great and Natalie, is that a similar experience for you? Uh, for me, um, yeah, it was. I'd been to a and &E in um, September with ongoing abdominal pain again. I um, just doubled over in pain um, awake all through the night. So I thought I'm going to have to attend a hospital to try and just determine the cause for the pain, really. Um, and I, I was there for a couple of hours and they couldn't determine the the cause of the pain or determine any diagnosis really. So I returned home quite upset, quite lost, quite anxious, quite distressed that I didn't really know what was happening. They couldn't essentially find anything wrong with me at, the, at that time. But yeah, so I was literally sat in the living room crying on the floor, searching Twitter, Facebook, trying to find just typing in keywords such as COVID, abdominal pain. And that's when I stumbled across a couple of the support groups. And again, like um, Lynn said, they've been an absolute lifesaver. It's, it's quite worrying to see how many other people are out there with very similar or also very different symptoms. Um, and it's quite reassuring that people are going through the same, but it's just such a sad, sad situation um, as well when, yeah, there's just nothing that people can seem to find wrong with you really, um, or even just go back to your pre-COVID way of life. Um, and you just sympathise with all these new people posting within the past couple of weeks saying this is my symptoms because they mirrored mine in July and I'm here now in January. Okay, yeah, slightly better, but again, six months down the line and we know the journey they've got ahead of them, which is quite quite scary. Thank you. Natalie? Uh, yeah, I think I uh, became aware of the Doctors Long Covid group in um on Facebook in, in about August time, a colleague mentioned it to me. And uh, I can echo what the uh, what Geraint and Lynn said that it was an absolute lifesaver at the time because I think at the time I was struggling uh, with sort of employment issues, not so much I was still being paid, but just getting any kind of support clinically uh, from, from my employer was not really happening. Uh, and I think uh, coming across it, I found others struggling with the same issue. And I think maybe something I'll just raise because I, I feel like the three of us have been relatively fortunate in terms of our employment status, but there's now over 900 doctors on our doctors support group for long COVID. We've had 100 members join in the last weekend. Uh, so I think we're starting to see the second wave of people affected by long COVID now coming in. Um, 900 doctors is an awful lot. Not all of them have long COVID, some are just interested, but the majority do. Uh, and many of our GP colleagues have actually really struggled with employment issues. Uh, so GP partners don't have the same protection that we have. Um, we were granted protection of, of sort of COVID sick leave that doesn't fit within our standard sick leave policies and uh, I think maybe lasts for a year or something. So, so that's really good, but GPs don't necessarily have that. And several of our friends have been made unemployed uh, and removed from their partnerships after six months because that's the partnership agreement. So not only are they struggling with a lot of symptoms, they're also now unemployed and have no idea what their source of income will be. Thank you. That's um, very troubling to hear. Uh, Tracy Braben. Yeah, we have covered a fair bit of it, but the question is about the support that you're getting. Um, and certainly you're going to be very supportive of others, like you say, on your journey. And thank you so much for your honest submissions. It is really, um, I mean, it's just blown my mind, the complexity of the symptoms. It isn't just exhaustion and fog. There's so many other things attached to it. Uh, one question just to posit is, I wonder if it's the viral 
who is doing the work on viral overload that partic particularly because you're obviously in the health service you're ex hyper exposed to the virus whether that has any impact but my question is your associations your unions your trade bodies um are you getting uh support from them um and where where is the support coming from for you we have sort of covered it uh, in some degree, but I wonder, um, Lynn, would you care to kick us off? Um, do you know of associations or trade unions or others in hospitals or uh, NHS that are actually supporting people at the front line like yourselves? So my union um, have been, uh, so the British Medical Association, they, they've been helpful when I've contacted them for some minor sort of salary questions and issues. Um, but that's the only involvement that I've had with them. So I don't think I can comment beyond that. Do they, are they understanding about long COVID? Do they understand your circumstances? They, they weren't initially. Initially, I was given the wrong advice, actually. So I wasn't under the, the COVID sick leave. Um, it had been communicated from my department correctly, but not been registered correctly with HR. I think I wasn't really sure about the details. Um, so my pay was then affected very, very early on. Um, and speaking to the BMA, they gave me advice without then mentioning that I should be under COVID sick leave. So it wasn't until I wrote a second, more generalized letter to them as a union, and uh, they got back to me and sort of questioned um, why my salary was affected in the way it was. Um, so it sort of went sort of the long winded back road for me to get that sorted. But that was back in June. Um, so ever since communicating with them now, they've been quite good. It does seem that the um, the unions also need to catch up with you about actually the scale of the problem potentially. Natalie, um, yeah, I think uh, I've had some some contact with the BMA. Uh, certainly, from an employment advice perspective, they've they've been helpful. Um, I think they're just about catching on in terms of long COVID and the impact that that's going to have on the medical workforce. So I think. Uh, they're, they're starting to make inroads into that. Um, I would say the Royal Colleges have been very variable. Uh, mm -hmm. The Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health has basically emailed me to say, oh, uh, well, this doesn't affect children, so it's not really a problem. And I, I've kind of said, well, actually, it does affect quite a lot of teenagers. Um, they haven't really been interested in terms of a member's perspective. They've been interested in terms of how it will affect our paediatric population, which obviously is, is important as well. But yeah, there, there's no real support there in terms of as a member. And certainly um, picking up about children is something that people really don't understand. So that was really great to raise that. Jaron? Um, yeah, so with... Um, is, there's a professional support body, the Royal Pharmaceutical Society, and speaking to colleagues from there and my um, indemnity insurance provider, I had obviously concerns that my pay could potentially be stopped due to sickness or in health or what would really happen, to be honest, with a sickness that doesn't really have any explained causes. Um, so they, they were really great with me, to be honest. Um, they gave me a lot of good advice. Um, and I also submitted a professional um, sort of like blog entry just to inform other professionals really about um, the risks of long COVID and how patients might present with long COVID because working on the wards they potentially could come in and I could be seeing a mirror image of me if I return back to work in the next couple of months which again is, is just trying to get the, the message out there really. Um, but in terms of support it's been quite difficult to get any really because if it's been such a novel and so sort of unknown illness um, I've been fortunate to have um, CBT sessions through health per, for health professionals Wales, um, just because I, I find it so difficult to find that I'm even now so unwell. Um, and they've just they've essentially giving me sessions to cope with living with a chronic, a chronic illness, really. Um, and again, as a 30 year old, we used to play football, go to the gym a couple of times a week. Um, now get out of breath even walking up one flight of stairs at home it's just really really difficult um so yeah but i think you've got to try and find the support which is quite difficult when you've got a lot of confusion a lot of symptoms a lot of lack of understanding of it it's just yeah it's just a minefield to be honest 
I think certainly we are going to face a mental health crisis, aren't we? Um, in the uh, coming months, so many people isolated and affected and confused with what's happening to them. Um, thank you, Leila. Thank you for th those submissions. Thank you, Tracy. Um, a quick follow up. Are any of you involved in or going to long COVID clinics that have been set up in different parts of the country? Um, if it's if it's a ubiquitous no, then I'll, I'll pass on to the next question that looks like a no so we'll come back to that I, I i have been i've been seen at um the uclh long covid clinic uh but through my neurologist so i'm based at queen square um seeing the neurologist there and they have now set up a covid neurology clinic so i'm under their covid neurology clinic okay thank they've you. been excellent I just yeah. wanted to comment as, as, as far as I'm aware wales is yet to introduce something similar to the clinics that are being set up across england it's a bit patchy. Um, Baroness Masham. I'm afraid you're on mute. Baroness Masham. It's the phrase of 2020. I'm there unmuted now. You're I'm unmuted. unmuted. Go ahead. Um, my quick question to the three is uh, were they tested positive? Because there's an awful lot of people who seem to get long COVID and they've never had a test. Um, what, what, what have they had? Are there three speakers there? Yeah, yeah so um, this is Natalie. So I, um, I was tested in March and there was a problem with the sample. So I it turned out to be negative but I think there was an issue it was repeat tested at 10 days it was negative I never had any antibodies uh to it uh and then I tested negative again in May so it's very confusing but I had every single symptom to meet the case definition plus a positive history of exposure so that's exactly what I've found with several people Great and Lynn um, yeah, similar to Natalie, I was tested in March um, and also tested negative, um, but um, I completely fit the clinical, um, the criteria for clinical diagnosis. Um, and I then had an antibody test, um, but it was in, at the end of September, so that was negative, which isn't very surprising. And great. And I tested positive in um, over Easter weekend in April um, and then had subsequent exposure on my return to work in July, um, which the test returned negative then, um, but I had antibodies a week prior. Um, and I'm also in a clinical trial, which is monitoring my antibody levels and I've still got antibodies at the moment. Um, so I had a positive swab, then a negative swab, although, although we probably think it was too early due to the time of exposure and the swab. Um, and also ongoing increase in levels of antibodies as well. Thank you. That's very helpful because one of our concerns um, is that there's underreporting of long COVID because it needs to be linked directly to a positive test. Um, so your stories are very interesting um, in that regard. Um, and just to, to follow up, uh, we are obviously trying to raise awareness uh, of long COVID, but uh, we have a particular interest. And so we, we know it's here. Um, what's your sense of public awareness of long COVID and what more do we need to communicate to the public uh, about it? Um, and uh, perhaps I'll start this time with Grant and then go to Natalie and then to Lynn. Um, to be honest, there's very little awareness of long COVID in the communities, the media, the public. Um, and this was kind of my um, motivation really to share my story with public professional media. Um, like I said, I was, I'm a 30 year old man. I was cr literally crying on the floor because I didn't know what to do, who to turn to with no support. Um, so for me, it's just, I'd, I'd hate to imagine there's other people out there who, is, who are going or will go through something very similar to myself. Um, it's just such a complex illness, how it fluctuates, it changes um, with no real under underlying pathology. Um, and you obviously experience setbacks, which again, make the symptoms very difficult to diagnose. Um, like we touched on before, as adults, we can communicate this as well, but children, again, not, not so able to do so. Um, and yeah, it's just, again, trying to raise awareness of all the ongoing symptoms. Like my symptoms are very different to Lynn's symptoms are very different to someone else's, but we all fit this kind of long COVID bubble. Uh, 
um, and nobody knows what to do with us really. So I think the more we raise awareness and the more we all share our common help educate others really um, going forward, especially as we, we move through the pandemic. Sorry, was it me next? I wasn't sure. <laughs> um, so I think um, awareness, I think, has improved over the last few months. Um, I think uh, it's still not great. Uh, certainly among the general public, as Garant was saying, but uh, I think even amongst the medical profession, it's certainly much better than it was. Uh, but I think we really need to uh, have much more awareness in primary care uh, for people to be recognised when they first present to their GPs. Um, there's a lot of, I think, misunderstanding to some degree how this may have been presented at the very beginning that this is a, a post viral fatigue or chronic fatigue uh, picture and I, and I think we need to be clear that this is actually a very different illness. There may be a subset who fit into a post viral fatigue category, but the vast majority of people have very clear organ pathology, which means it doesn't fit within a chronic fatigue syndrome diagnosis. Uh, and I think that's what we need to get out there. And it's one of the reasons I think maybe the BMA was a little bit slow to catch on at first, because a lot of people were just sort of putting it down to a post viral fatigue uh, category. Uh, I think that realization is changing, uh, but certainly I think um, we need better in a better recognition by employers because I think that there there are uh, a lot of people who have struggled with employment issues and support from their employers recognizing that this is a, a genuine condition and that it might be off work for a, a significant period of time um, and I think we need better recognition in the public particularly uh, the younger public who who think that they're invincible uh, and uh, you know I'm, I'm 38 and I wonder if I'll ever be able to walk properly without crutches again will this continue to get worse will I end up in a wheelchair uh, and I think if people thought of Covid as not just a mild illness they thought of it as you know you know people think mild or severe and if you're old you're going to get severe and end up in hospital and if you're young you'll probably just have a bit of symptoms get over it and it'll be fine I think they need to realize there's there's an in-between there where yes you may not die but you may have long-term problems following it and then I can only echo everything that Natalie is saying absolutely I mean I think the average adult um, who's not at a high risk of getting severe COVID just don't consider long COVID to be a risk that applies to them somehow awareness definitely has increased but we still have a long way to go and I think a lot of employers um, also think that people can be put back into work uh, before being completely well without realizing um, how long COVID has such a relapsing and remitting pattern. So, yeah. Thanks very much. Um, Paul Strasberger. Hi there. Uh, welcome to, to all three of you. Um, and thank you for sharing your story. I didn't hear anything said about any treatment that you might be getting. Are you receiving any treatment that uh, is relieving symptoms or, or taking you to a better place? And if so, um, is it working? Would you like to go first, Geraint? Um, yeah, so um, I've had um, prescription medication, prescription pain relief, um, didn't change my symptoms at all, to be honest. Um, sometimes as soon as I was taking the medication, I was just passing them completely through me, to be honest. Um, it was like as if my, my body just didn't want anything inside it. Um, I've had colonoscopies, I've had biopsies taken and nothing seems to be showing at the moment. So I'm still a bit, it's reassuring that there's nothing concerning of underlying pathology, but again, there is still my ongoing symptoms and the fluctuating and the changing symptoms as well. Um, fortunately, I've just out of interest of trying to get well myself, I've pushed myself to be in a couple of different trials and I think a lot of my diagnosis have, has come from trials instead of primary and secondary clear clinicians so um so yeah to be honest no no nothing has helped really uh, thank you and Lynn um I'm only on um a tablet to treat my pericarditis and then um a medication to lower my um very high uh, heart rate that's it so it's all about treating symptoms rather than Curing. Um, and Natalie. Um, so I have had a lot of investigations and I think um, everything's a little bit inconclusive in terms of exactly what's going on. So um, I think the neurologists have been a little bit 
loath to try and treat me with anything that would suppress my immune system but at the same time because things are getting worse I think there's lots of conversations about what what should happen but obviously it's slightly unknown territory um, I'm on some uh, quite strong medication to relieve neurological pain. I get a lot of uh, pain in my back and, and uh, in my spine and down my arms. So uh, I'm on some pain relief for that, but that, that's it really. So it's all about suppressing symptoms, but medical science hasn't really come to your rescue as yet. Thank you. Thank you. Baroness Brinton. Yes, thank you very much. Um, it's interesting to, to hear about all the different symptoms in different medical disciplines. Can I ask if there's any coordination between those disciplines uh, and whether having one lead discipline who actually took responsibility for the whole patient would help? As with gerontology, I have autoimmune disease, so as with autoimmune disease. So Natalie, do you want to go first and then Lynn and then Grant this time? Um, yeah, I think it's really important that there is a, a sort of one named individual that's going to coordinate, particularly because um, in my case, I largely have neurological problems, but a lot of people have multi-system problems uh, and there needs to be communication between different specialists. And I think that's best served by having one nominated healthcare professional who takes the lead and then helps with the coordination. Uh, I think I'm quite fortunate with the neurology team. They they uh, since the beginning of the pandemic have had neurology MDTs to support people who were inpatients with COVID and had neurological problems, and so that's kind of been expanded now to dealing with people who have ongoing problems, even if they weren't hospitalised. Um. So. Where I'm in here in Wales, since we don't have any clinics at all, I completely agree with Natalie that it should be one lead that then links in with everything else because symptoms are so overlapping um, and it can be multi-system or it can be a symptom that seems to be for one system, but it's actually caused by another um, system. Um, but at the moment in Wales, it's, it's nothing. So there's no coordination at all. So people are basically waiting for many months for appointments to several different specialties, um, which makes care extremely disjointed and inefficient. And great, anything to add? Yeah, just again to echo Lynn really, there's nothing in Wales for us at the moment. And I'm under gastroenterology, ENT, um, neurology, and cardiology and again like Lynn it's just so disjointed and there's nothing here for patients in Wales really and um, I do think we we do need multidisciplinary teamwork really to kind of help uh, help the patient really um, and I know in England a lot of the support is more rehab support rather than again diagnostics um, but I don't think we're quite there to be able to be rehabilitated some of us at the moment um, we need to recover first and then we can perhaps look at the the rehabilitation side of the illness, but without kind of support or early guidance into helping patients, we could be looking at something which is ongoing for quite some time um, with one in 10 patients having symptoms for part over 12 weeks. Um, yeah, we could be looking at numbers if it's say 10% of the amount of people who have COVID at the moment, we, there could be a significant amount of people affected long, long term. Thank you, Grant. And, and that's something we're going to be very much keeping uh, an eye on and, and pressing on. Um, Barbara Keeley. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you for the evidence you've given us today in helping us to understand the real impact of long COVID on your lives. Um, just a question for each of you. What more must be done urgently to support those living with long COVID? Um, and, and, and perhaps we, we touched on medical support, but uh, things like financial aid, you know, changes at work, reskilling, what, whatever uh, you think you might need and others with long COVID might need. So um, let's start with Natalie. Uh, yeah, thank you. I, I think um, particularly from a healthcare worker perspective, I'd, I'd say one of the things we need to do is try and prevent it. And I know that sounds uh, impossible, but actually I think from a, for healthcare workers, uh, we really do need better personal protective equipment. Um, and I say that because the, as somebody with experience of PPE and training people in PPE, um, our guidance is in the UK is the lowest level of guidance of anywhere in the world. Uh, it was lower than the WHO guidance, uh, maybe only slightly, but but was lower. 
uh, and that needs to change, uh, especially with this new variant, it is highly transmissible and we need, uh, I, I would advocate for FFP3 uh, or FFP2 at least masks for, for anyone working with known COVID patients uh, and, and even possibly outside of that, we need to try and prevent people being infected uh, and we can do that as well by vaccination. And I know that the government has now brought forward vaccination for healthcare workers, but I think we could argue that if that had been done in December and they had been prioritized in December, we may not quite have the problems in the NHS that we have now because we wouldn't have so many people off sick uh, or isolating. Um, so that that's what one part. I, I think um, we need to advocate for the health and safety executive riddle reporting uh, so that employers should be riddle reporting anyone who's been infected in the employment setting uh, but many employers are somewhat loath to do that because it does result in a significant investigation sometimes um, and also the HSE said that um, if people were given adequate PPE and, and by that they just mean a surgical face mask then it couldn't possibly have been transmitted in a healthcare setting uh, well we know that PPE is not 100% even if you have really good PPE so uh, I think we need to have that changed and you know I've been trying to get Great Ormond Street to report this for four months uh, on my behalf uh, and I'm still waiting um, and they're going through a process of trying to get occupational health to confirm that it was an occupationally acquired illness and, and so on so that that's one area and um, I think uh, it, to help with that, it needs to become recognized as an occupational disease, uh, not just for healthcare workers. I mean, it's affected bus drivers, it's affected uh, uh, you know, people in many different sectors, but it needs to be considered an occupational disease, particularly in a healthcare setting. Uh, and that will help with the riddle reporting. Uh, and then that will help with counting it. So I think we need, we need the government to count it in a sense of when we're reporting our statistics, we, we don't just report survived versus died or, or, or percentage died. We need to also be reporting percentage impacted uh, with a long-term condition. Uh, and, and we need definitions therefore of the condition to do that, which we now have a little bit through the NICE guidance, we have uh, coding that can now be used, but it does need to be reported because this is going to be a significant impact of this pandemic in the long-term, even once the, uh, surges over even once the vaccine has helped to help to allow us to lead slightly more normal lives um, it's going to be a problem um, and uh, then also identifying it appropriately in primary care as I mentioned before uh, and I agree I think there needs to be some form of hardship fund for people for people who've lost their jobs and can't uh, uh, you know very suddenly and need to access uh, some kind of fund fairly urgently and then also for people who need access to uh, specialist equipment. Um, I, I can't drive at the moment legally. Uh, I don't know if I'll ever be able to legally drive again in a normal vehicle, uh, but I have no idea even how to get to work at the moment because I can't walk far enough to, to get to a train. Uh, I can't afford to take a minicab every day. So it's just lots of different things like that where I think actually I just need a modified vehicle and then I can get around, can get to work, can do my job. Uh, but it's it's just things like that that I don't even know how to access myself and I'm a healthcare professional. <laughs> Thank you. Thank if you. I could just jump in there, sorry, Barbara, but just to sorry, say- We're something. running out of time. So just we really need to- Whoever is your MP, Natalie, please contact them because they will be able to try and support you. Completely agree, yeah. If we can go to um, Lynn and Geraint. I think I'll just echo everything that Natalie has said. <laughs> she covered it very well. Thank you. And Geraint? Um, yeah, like we said, in Wales, there's no clinics at the moment. So the sooner we can get support for the patients in Wales, really the better. Um, again, and I think unless you have long COVID, you don't really understand long COVID. Um, and the only support I found was from speaking to other um, sort of patients living with long COVID, to be honest. Um, so we are quite an untapped resource in terms of understanding the illness, being participants in research. Like I said, the, the amount of understand that I, I know of my illness has come from trials and sort of self-interest and being involved in, in research, to be honest. But that could be just part of my background. If you've got someone who's not uh, able to kind of engage in, in, in that type of care, then I, I really think it's going to be difficult to be part of some kind of, of trial, um, which again, if we leave patients at home, they could have undiagnosed organ failure or undiagnosed organ damage, which again has a further burden long long term on the NHS long after the pandemic is finished. Yeah, thank you. 
Thank you all, dear. Yes. Well, thank you all so much. Um, and that brings us to the end of uh, this portion of the evidence session, but this panel. Um, I, I'm sure I speak for everyone who's been watching and, and everyone who's been questioning. Um, uh, your contributions have been invaluable, um, very much echoing the over a thousand other contributions we've had. Um, but I think hearing it from those who are in the middle of this uh, has really, again, brought it to light uh, for us. And we will be raising the issues that you uh, have raised uh, both in Parliament on Wednesday itself, uh, sorry, Thursday itself for the debate, um, but also ongoing. And we will be writing to ministers and the government again, um, basing our recommendations on this evidence. So a big heartfelt thank you from everyone on this panel for sharing so openly and honestly your stories. And so Natalie, Geraint and Lynn, thank you so much from all of us. Um, you are very welcome to stay for the next panel, which I think will also be a very fascinating panel. Uh, so don't feel you have to rush off if you don't want to, but equally you are busy people with other things to do as well. So if you do have to go, uh, we shan't be offended. Um, please just go ahead and, and do that. Uh, and for the second uh, part of the session, I'm now going to pass to Caroline Lucas to chair. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Leila. And thank you again from me for the everyone who took part in that first session, it was incredibly powerful. I'm really, really um, happy to be able to introduce two expert um, witnesses for our evidence session now, Dr. Nizreen Alwan uh, and Professor Danny Altman. Thank you both uh, so much for, for being here. Dr. Nizreen Alwan is Associate Professor in Public Health at the University of Southampton and Honorary Consultant in Public Health at the University Hospital Southampton NHS Trust. And she is living with long COVID. And Professor Danny Altman is Professor of Immunolo Immunology at Imperial College London. And during the pandemic, he's acted in several advisory roles, including the House of Commons and House of Lords Science Committees and the Immunology Task Force to SAGE. So thank you for your time and welcome to our session. I wanted to um, just start off by asking you both really, are we once again seeing, or as we are once again seeing a huge rise in, in in cases of COVID across the UK. What does that mean for long COVID? Will we imagine that the long COVID cases will go up in proportion to the overall cases of, of COVID? And in particular, what impact does viral load have on your likelihood of contracting long COVID and the seriousness with which it might hit you if you do? Uh, maybe I could come to Dr. Uh, Alwyn first on, on that one, please. Thank you so much for inviting me um, to take to give um, um, to give um, uh, to talk here. So um, it's really very concerning. In the last seven days, just in the last seven days, there were over four hundred thousand confirmed COVID cases. So if we take the most conservative, a conservative estimate really of ten percent, this this is the Office of National Statistics estimates. So ten percent of people, uh, you know, not recovering, still having symptoms uh, after twelve weeks. Uh, that's 40,000. But actually, if we do take the um, kind of the estimates from the ONS about how common the infection is, because there are a lot of people not testing and not accessing testing, um, that's over a million. Uh, um, you know, and that's the estimate from the end of December, early January. Um, so that basically means over 100,000 long COVID. I mean, the numbers are st staggering, and that means more illness, more disability. Um, and, you know, affecting work, affecting caring responsibility for people who are largely, you know, previously healthy, um, uh, you know, people, you know, younger age, probably the people. The, 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 the main issue is, uh, which I've been kind of talking about for months now, is that we do not have a system um, to record this. We do not have a system to measure this huge morbidity burden of COVID, like we now see statistics every day on the number of positive uh, cases and the number of deaths and the number of hospital admissions and you know people going into ICU nobody is measuring that and and that is really key to do anything if we're not if we don't quantify the problem how can we do anything about it um, and, I, and I think to quantify it it's, it's difficult it's difficult but actually it's doable because you can quantify it in two main ways one is um, you um, measure who recovers, you try and quantify who recovers. So if we're testing people and there's a test and trace and we know who's got it, you know, some simple follow up, even a text message to ask people after a while, have they recovered or not? And then the other way is, is having some patient registers of long COVID now that GPs are diagnosing long COVID uh, and we need to get better of the, at this because we need 
some universal case definitions because there's still huge variation clinically in you know defining you know in, in, in giving that diagnosis. But once we have them, we need some patient registers and we can quantify it. Thank you. And uh, Professor Altman. Yeah, let me kind of home in on some of those points and, and reinforce some of them. So, you know, I, I agree with, with the, obviously all that was just said that, you know, by my calculations, even if we take the conservative lower limit for prevalence of long COVID, this country at the moment probably has more than 300,000 cases. Um, and, and um, you know, the, the world probably more than 7 million cases. So, you know, when we heard Chris Whitty earlier in the week talking about a kind of existential crisis in the NHS because of the current acute cases, how much more so if you don't think of them as acute cases, but you think we've, we've added a disease burden as large as all the arthritis patients in Britain, again, from this one disease, and we have no plan, no NHS provision. We don't know whether this is for three months or six months or six years or forever, but you can't just say we need some long COVID clinics to deal with this extra threat because Who's in the clinics? Where are they? Who are the doctors? Where are the extra doctors? Where are the extra nurses? Um, you know, many pertinent points that were raised in, in the first session. Unless we've got a lot of research to work out what this is and understand the mechanism, how do we know what are the care pathways? Which doctors need to be linked up in that clinic? What therapeutics they're going to be given to make this better? Um, unless we can address any, any of these things, you know, we can't ever improve it. And the only other point I'd, I'd add as a sort of opener is, um, again, reinforcing some of the points we heard earlier. Every time I go on TV or radio, I'm faced with that kind of devil's advocate response of, well, I'm not, I'm not an old person, I'm not in a care home. Do I need to care about this? Do I need a vaccine? Do I, do I need to socially distance? It doesn't really concern me. And I think the kind of evidence we have on show here and me talking about you know, 300,000 plus people presently in Britain means it's a real game of Russian roulette because you don't know whether you're going to be one of the people who's better in two weeks or one of the people who's going to be on crutches or in a wheelchair for months or years or forever. Um, and how, how many of us want to take that risk? Uh, that, that's incredibly powerfully put. Thank you. Can I just impress you on that point about viral load? Is there any correlation that we know of in terms of your propensity to get long COVID and the amount of viral load you might have received? Yeah, no, I, I heard your point before. So, so, so I'd um, refer anybody who loves the details of this to um, a paper that I'm waving around that you can't read, but it's, it's, in the, it's in the Lancet last week. And it's the biggest study that's yet been published out of Wuhan on 1700 people um, and it's sort of minutiae of their disease and the correlates. And what it says to me is that there are some manifestations like long term lung changes and CT changes where the risk goes up with the viral load and severity of your initial disease and lots of other stuff where it doesn't and it doesn't matter. So you could be somebody who barely knew you had COVID and never had a COVID positive test and could still be dogged for months or years with long COVID. So kind of complex answer to your question. The answer is yes and no. Some things go up with viral load, other things not. Okay, thank you. Um, Baroness Brinton. Yes, thank you very much. Um, we heard from the witnesses in the first session about the... Uh, inconsistent support for long COVID patients is probably the most diplomatic way of putting it. And I just wondered what is needed most urgently now to support and treat those with long COVID. Is clear guidance yet available for all primary and secondary uh, care environments on treating long COVID? I mean, I mean, I know we're all learning a lot. And can I repeat the question I asked them about, should there be one lead to cover all the multidisciplinary uh, areas that are covered by long COVID, as as with uh, um, autoimmune disease and uh, gerontology, to ensure that there is coordination, not just for the benefit of the patient, but also for the benefit of the research that uh, Dr. Alwan was talking about that we need so urgently. Shall I go? Uh, yep. yeah, so, so thank you so very much for this question. I think, first of all, people living with long COVID need recognition. Um, and although that is getting slowly better. And we've heard in the first session how at the start, really, that was um, a, a very big problem, you know, dismissive behavior, really not knowing disbelief about, you know, this, you know, this can't be linked or this is not COVID. I think it's still, um, it, it, it's still a problem. And so every, you know, I think recognition um, of, of the people having long COVID and recognition that we don't know 
you know, of, of our really vast ignorance of, on this on this area. We've heard different, you know, symptoms. There is there are patterns emerging in these symptoms in terms of, you know, some people will have different things, you know, later on and, you know, more at the beginning. But really, it's a very, very unknown area. So uh, acknowledging um, um, the our, um, our not knowing and honoring, um, you know, patient stories, really, you know, and, and there are there are patterns. So I think we can come up with these some sort of universal uh, and inclusive case definitions for the clinicians to recognize. I think the other thing is um, to actually once you have a suspected long COVID, people need thorough physical examination, thorough investigations, medical investigations, because the key, a key thing to do, and this was definitely a concern for me, is that you don't want to miss something that could be treated, you know, like a blood clot, for example, or, you know, a, you know, a block in, in your heart vessels, you know, uh, and these are things that we can find with the proper investigation. So these needs to be done and there shouldn't be a quick um, premature jumping into less you know, go and, and treat this with, say, you know, psycholog psychological interventions or, you know, things like that, which obviously are an important component, but I think it's really important to have these uh, investigations. Um, and they need, you know, obviously people need to be to rest. Um, and we've heard, again, it's, a, it's an illness that's fluctuating, comes and goes, and people tend to go back to work, and they're not being able to work. And there needs to be a recognition and adequate sick pay and ability to um, to take time off. And just to, answer, just to answer your questions about, you know, one... Um, kind of uh, somebody responsible. I think that is a really great model um, to have somebody, I would maybe call it more coordinating because um, again, the, the, what we know so far is most uh, patients have multi-system involvement. So it's not just one system involvement. Um, they might need more care for certain systems than others, but I think having a coordinating um, point would be, would be very helpful. Yeah. Professor Oldman? Yeah, so, you know, so I think between them, um, um, Baroness Brinton and Lord Strasberger have kind of brought up the key points to highlight. And these are the points that I'd urge you to bring up to all your influential friends and spread the word because you know, it is the heart of the matter that un until we understand what it is, who has it and what the mechanism is, um, we don't know how to treat it. We don't know who has to treat it and what therapeutics you can give people to make them better so that they can resume their lives. But there's no point, and it's a great start to have a long COVID clinic and you know, put the sign over the door, but who is going to sit in that clinic and how are we going to join up that care? So the, the analogy I'd make is, you know, everybody's come across people who have lupus. So for lupus, um, you know, an immunological disease, the, it's caused by um, autoimmune antibodies against DNA and DNA binding proteins, which sounds very simple, and yet the disease is very complex and multi-system. And sometimes you might want to see a rheumatologist, and sometimes you might want to see a neurologist, and sometimes you might want to see a renal doctor, depending on the symptoms you have and where and how it's affecting you. But unless you've got a joined up model for why all those things are happening, how on earth are you going to help that person? Um, you know, the, the, the other sort of example I'd give you is that one of the ways that I got into this is that as an immunologist, I'm very interested in another viral infection in Brazil. Well, it's a mosquito-borne disease called chikungunya. And in Brazil, they're very used to mosquito-borne diseases. They've got dengue and they've got Zika. But what they weren't ready for was a variant on that kind of viral infection and chikungunya, where sure it infects you and you get the fever and you get the malaise and you feel ill for a little while. But 30 or 40% of those people go down with a long-term chronic arthritis afterwards that wrecks their lives. It puts them out of work, it makes them feel suicidal, it, um, it excludes them from society, and their healthcare system is just packed out with these long-term cases that they weren't ready for, hadn't budgeted for, didn't have the clinics for, and didn't have the doctors for. So you can hear from my tone of voice, I'm kind of saying, let that be a warning to us, and let's plan ahead. Is that okay, Baroness Brinson? Should I move on to, uh, to, to Debbie Abrams? Thanks, thanks very much, uh, Caroline, uh, and good morning, uh, everyone. I was um, very uh, interested in, in uh, when I was uh, reading the NICE guidelines around um, COVID uh, and uh, particularly around uh, uh, long COVID. Um, and I wondered in terms of your perspective around whether you feel that um, the 12 weeks um, um, 
cohort of, of, of patients who are still uh, experiencing symptoms after that, whether there is anything um, akin to uh, post-viral syndrome um, and what we can learn from how that has been managed and what we need to be looking out for. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, um, um, so, so I think um, obviously we've had uh, recently, just before Christmas, we had the NICE um, sign and RCGP guidelines, and that's that's been great to actually have these guidelines. Uh, I think one very positive thing that the guideline brought was that they really stress um, it's very important not to discriminate uh, based on whether you've had a positive test or not in uh, you know diagnosis and management of long COVID. That's a very, very important point for people with long COVID because that's been an ongoing problem. Um, I think, um, as I said, it's, we really still don't know. Long COVID is you know, being used comfortably by many people, mainly you know, people living with long COVID as an umbrella term. And I think there's a wide recognition that it could be that there are multiple conditions within that umbrella term that we are still, you know, we, it's still difficult to distinguish. I think um, putting everything, uh, you know, so the new, the new um, term that's used in the clinical guidelines is post-COVID syndrome. And I think that, you know, kind of implied that we might know the mechanisms underlying what was, what's going on uh, which really, you know, we don't, uh, you know, it could be, this is um, classical post-viral syndrome for some, um, it could be this is uh, very similar to ME, chronic fatigue syndrome for some, it could be there are other things, you know, multiple systems, so, that, so there might be other things, particular syndromes that might emerge later once we understand more about the me mechanisms and how the symptoms clusters and, and, and the organ damage associated with it. Um, so I think that I think we need to, um, uh, you know, kind of be uh, recognize that that this is unknown um, and continue to go. So the cutoff itself, the 12 weeks, I do think, uh, you know, the, I mean, the most anxious period for me, really. And although that was kind of early on, was that period between maybe four weeks and 12 weeks, because, you know, um, I think people need support during that period. So I think if we say, well, nothing can be done until you get to 12 weeks. Uh, you know, that's, um, that's not right. But also, I mean, I the, the guidelines don't say that because they have the categories of ongoing um, symptoms for four to 12 weeks and then 12 weeks after. I think the time cutoff um, can be, you know, is, is not that, um, is a bit arbitrary. You need a time cutoff for definitions um, as long as you acknowledge that, um, you know, it varies. I, I do think anything beyond four weeks, you know, needs attention. But also you've heard very, very starkly from the first session that this very striking um, kind of uh, flu fluctuation and the coming and going of the illness, mm -hmm. which has been, uh, you know, it's very distressing. Uh, and I, you know, I've experienced as well, every time you think you're almost there and you're recovering mm -hmm. and then it comes back. Uh, and I think in between people can function much better than when, you know, when you, when you have, you know, the relapse of uh, symptoms. So how clinical guidelines need to acknowledge that very well, because it seems to be a very prominent feature of the illness. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Professor Altman? Yeah, uh, all I'd add to that, you know, I think I wrote somewhere that, um, you know, just stating the obvious, really, that this is a chapter of the medical textbooks that hasn't yet been written, but mm -hmm. God, it urgently needs to be written because, you know, when we first started talking about this, I'd have clinical colleagues saying to me, well, you know, you're bound to feel a bit rough and depressed when you've been in hospital. What do they expect? Um, you know, that's all it is. And, um, you know, it so isn't just that, you know, as you've heard in the evidence this, this, this morning, that, you know, my job as somebody who spent my whole life in medical research mm -hmm. is to observe the pathology and try and understand the pathophysiology and try and attach a gene or a transcript or a molecule or a cell to a mechanism and work out what's gone wrong and what you would need to do to make it better. So mm -hmm. when I try and gather together all of the evidence in this field, I see an awful lot of people on planet Earth who didn't have these symptoms before and now have... Um, wheeze and chest pain and cardiovascular problems and joint problems and brain fog and movement disabilities and all the things that healthy young people didn't have before. Mm -hmm. And I think we have a real um, obligation to do the medical research and fund the medical research to work out what on earth is going on and do something about it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we mustn't get lost in some sort of diffuse, oh, you know, they feel a bit rough, you know, poor dears. Um, you know, we've got to characterize it and sort it out. Uh, absolutely. And I think people who have had both post-viral syndrome uh, 
or um, um, ME or chronic fatigue, uh, chronic f fatigue syndrome would, would say that it, it hasn't automatically been taken seriously by uh, uh, many in the medical profession. Um, so as again, I, I just want to, to, to make sure that we are looking to see what we might learn from, from those areas where there is a, uh, there, there may be some, uh, some overlap. Thank you so much. May I just add very quickly, because I think that's very importantly, I think let's, if we want to be positive and look at a silver, silver lining here, this, these conditions have been largely neglected yes, uh, they you know, have. In, in medicine, um, yep. in, in all sorts of aspects. So if we want to, you know, maybe use this pandemic and this huge wave of long COVID as a way to actually give more attention um, and, and support and recognition and care and, and for, 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 this, for this group of conditions, that, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you very much, both of you. Thanks. Thanks, Debbie. I'm coming to Tracy Braben. Um, yes, thank you. Well, the current vaccination policy in the UK rolls the vaccine out to the most vulnerable. Um, given we don't know yet the impact of the vaccination reducing transmission, um, what do you think the impact can be on long COVID? Um, Professor Altman. Yeah, can I go first? Yes, please. Yeah. yeah. So, 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 um, you know, it's something I, I get asked about a lot. Um, my, my, my sort of high level answer has become a simple answer that, um, you know, we're, we've had a ghastly year and a debacle of a pandemic. And the only trick we have up our sleeve is to reduce the pandemic and block transmission. And apart from social distancing, by far the biggest weapon in our armory are these amazing effective vaccines that we have, you know, two on board at the moment and about to be free. And if currently we're, you know, we're generating 50,000 cases of COVID a day and you know, five to 10,000 cases of long COVID for our medium to long term future, the best way to stop that happening is to get the vaccine to as many people as possible, as fast as possible. Um, and that's you know, absolutely you know, by a million miles the best thing we can do, because if you have any of these vaccines, you'll have a pretty good level of neutralizing antibodies. And if you have those, the virus can't get into your cells. Um, so, so, that, so that's step one. And, you know, step two is what do we, what do we think about um, vaccine for the people who already had the virus or even people who've had the virus and had long COVID. And I know that people have been very perplexed about that. And, you know, the jury is out because all of these things are being learned in real time and we've never been there before. And I know that some people in the long COVID community say, well, I feel very vulnerable. I should be on the list to be vaccinated soon because I feel terrified of reinfection. And some people feel quite the opposite. They feel, well, maybe I've overreacted to the virus in the past in some way that's been deleterious. So perhaps I'd rather wait with my, with, with my, with my, with my vaccine because I'm worried it might do me some harm. And I'm, I'm sympathetic to both those views um, and the data aren't there yet to know which group are more correct. And you know, people are very diverse and there may be different answers for different people. But my simple answer is that this is a horrible virus and people who have the vaccine will be better off than people who don't. But the question still remains, doesn't it, that those who are um, suffering with long COVID, do we know yet what their response would be to the vaccine? Well, I'll let the Raven come in, come in a minute. I'll say one more sentence. That, um, that on the whole, the general advice is, um, is people who, who feel they've been, or who know they've been infected before, should nevertheless come forward with the vaccine because we fear um, reinfection. And you know, from my immunological concept, I've at the moment got no particular reason to think that making an enhanced immune response to spike antigen would exacerbate or increase your risk of long COVID. But um, you know, no, no data yet. Dr. Alwan. Thank you so much for this question. This is really key now because um, I do can con get concerned about hearing um, the approach of we will vaccinate the vulnerable and then we'll open up um, and then that, you know, there's no reason that we think the virus could stop then and, you know, get scared and go away. The virus will start, you know, continue to spread, uh, you know, really concerned that it might step, st spread uncontrollably, uncontrollably among people who are not vaccinated. We don't know who's vulnerable in terms of morbidity, in terms of developing long COVID and organ damage. Um, so um, um, so the, 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 the danger it poses is that you would then get more morbidity, but also by the, you know, vaccinating just the, you know, the priority group and then, and then letting the virus spread, that means more chance of the virus getting, we get more mutations and the mutations could then become 
vaccine resistant, you know, leading the virus becoming vaccine resistance, and then everybody, <laughs> everybody, will, you know, will will be liable for infection again. So I think it's really important that we have a clear strategy. Um, absolutely right to to vaccinate the priority groups who are at more risk of death, uh, but we have to have a clear strategy that we still need to control the infection until most of the population is vaccinated, really, because of those uh, risks. Um, and 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 particularly, I think for people. Uh, and in terms of that control, you know, it's mainly about systematic structural uh, changes, uh, not you know, not entirely focusing on individual behavior instructions. I think we, we need those and we need to see those while we're in this terrible uh, lockdown and particularly for the disadvantaged because the vicious, vicious cycle here, we've heard a lot about the inequalities in COVID, um, you know, mortality, but uh, the inequalities and in morbidity it, it pro will probably be, turn out to be higher because people are more likely, more disadvantaged people, are more likely to be exposed, get COVID, more like you know, and then get much, much, you know, long COVID, more likely not to rest, not to have sick pay, not to have even adequate maybe recognition, uh, you know, by the you know the health and care sector because we haven't understood and we haven't got very specific case definition yet, and then the vicious cycle continues. So we really need to have that in mind, and we need to manage expectations. For everybody you know that, that this needs to continue so that doesn't mean remaining in lockdown forever that means that we need to prepare how to keep the infections low when we come out of lockdown we really need to have a tight strategy for that yes here here to that caroline thank you thanks tracy um lord strasberger could we come to you next please because uh catherine's not here sure. uh, good afternoon uh, we've heard mention of uh, the guidelines on long COVID already. There's been some criticisms of them, and I'm just wondering how you feel they reflect the reality of long COVID. Would you like to go first, Professor Altman? Well, I, I think I'm going to let Dr. Elwin go first because she's been really at the heart of, 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 of this. Now, I'll, I'll, yeah? I'll take your advice. Yes, yes, go, go Dr. for it. Elwin. Yeah, thank you so much for this question. Yeah, I think I, I, I touched on the guidelines a bit and I did, I, they are, I, I think I, they're commendable because they came in very quickly and we're ahead of uh, most other countries, if not the first in, in this regard. So this is, this is great. They are living guidelines. So that means they need updated all the time. Um, and also I commended the bit about, you know, the recognition of people who haven't got that uh, pos positive test um, you know, in terms of accessing care. Uh, but I think um, I, I think we need more details in the guidelines. I think particularly, uh, you know, from the from, from the point I've been, you know, kind of working on and advocating a lot on in terms of how you, um, you know, what are these criteria for referral of people to all these services? What are the exact investigations? Uh, how, how, which case, you know, do, do we have different case definitions um, indicating different kind of pathways and all of that. So they're, they're all kind of layered, um, um, you know, um, detail that I'm, I'm hoping will come, you know, and these guidelines will update it. Uh, but also, I think I also touched on the, um, on, on what we're calling it. Um, and, um, and I think it, it is uh, wiser to stick to that broad uh, term of long COVID, uh, because basically all that term is saying is saying this is a condition and it's long and it's not going away uh, while actually having labels um, including things like you know the actual label of post-covid syndrome means you know it, it is implying that we know the mechanism that the, you know something is gone and there's a you know post stage and you know uh, and, and you know and I think we're still not there yet um, so um, and, and the guidelines do refer to this to, to the to to the condition as it's also known as long uh, COVID, but I think it's important. It's really, really, really important uh, because the patients are the experts here. They are the absolute experts. Uh, you know, uh, people. The ex, you know, even you know, for us. I mean, I'm, I have I have come kind of a double hat of the public health um, and the patients. But actually, it's talking to patients. They understand the condition, and they also because there have been such a cohesive network of support. Um, a lot of the patients understand what you know. Other people, you know, other patients, other people living with co long COVID are, are, are living with, and I think their input is is really important in developing everything around long COVID. Thank you for that. Uh, we, we've heard today and in August from six uh, victims of uh, long COVID and maybe by chance they've all been uh, working in the medical profession. Um, is, is there any evidence that there's a preponderance of 
of people working in the medical profession who are suffering from long COVID? No, I, I don't think so at all. I think that's um, um, ascertainment bias, if I if I may, because um, may well you be know, so. as, as, as you'd imagine, people who come out of medicine are um, vocal and informed and well connected to comment on it. Um, but you know, I you know, I promise you, amongst those, um, you know, the people I flagged up, the greater than three hundred thousand people who I suspect probably have it in the UK, there are you know supermarket workers and bus drivers and all the people you know, representing those who've been exposed to SARS-CoV-2 in, 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 in the last year. Um, but, you know, when you talk about, you know, how it's all going to work and come together and, and the NICE guidelines, I, I feel like it's a work in progress. And the NICE guidelines were actually a rather good document, but it is very much um, in progress. So I don't know at the moment for any of those people how good their chances are if they feel really rough with their... Um, difficulties in movement or breathing or brain fog or concentration, whatever it is, and they turn up at their GP, will they get into an appropriate care pathway? Will they be referred to an appropriate team? And will there be some sort of management that might help them? Um, and it's tall order at the moment. And we need to really, really work on that. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Paul. I'm going to go back to Tracy Braben now for a further question. Yeah, thank you. This is just so interesting. And thank you so much for your, um, your brilliance and the work that you've done so far. Um, my question is, um, what's the impact on lung COVID from a public health messaging point of view? Because obviously, it's protect the NHS, protect the vulnerable. The concern is that maybe when numbers of admissions go down or mortality numbers go down, that we will change our uh, public health messaging and whether um, the public need to be aware that long COVID is also still out there and a potential um, uh, could potentially impact on their lives. Um, so basically, is the impact of long COVID understood at public health level and what the impact that that can have on the messaging? Uh, Dr. Alwan. Thank you so much for this question. I think despite that, the fact that we've come a long way um, in, in long COVID, that people are recognising it, um, there's much more cover of it. I think that we still, unfortunately, have this black and white picture in public messages. Um, you know, our leaders, when they, you know, come and talk about, uh, you know, um, you know, the restrictions that we need to have, you know, the vaccine, all the, you know, topics that everybody, you know, wants to know about, um, they seem to be talking about deaths as the only bad outcome from um, COVID-19, which, which, which we know isn't uh, because, you know, of this huge uh, problem, you know, morbidity burden. Uh, and I think this partly could be tackled by, as I mentioned, by measuring it, because if we have the stats, we've heard the stories, there's, there's so many stories, you've got the stories, you know, hundreds of, you know, uh, you know, stories and evidence, uh, uh, but, you know, that needs to be, there's another layer, we need the stats to, to, to quantify the, the, the problem to everybody, to the policymakers, to the, you know, scientists, to the doctors, to the public, so that they understand, and I think the messaging as well about uh, you know, protecting the NHS, obviously, you know, but, but, but the NHS is not an it, it's them, you know, the people. So obviously we're protecting these people, but also I think the message needs to be protect yourself, protect your family, because you don't know, uh, you know, if you get this virus, whether you, you know, if you're younger, uh, if you're completely healthy, uh, it, it might, it's maybe, it's unlikely that you get admitted to hospital or to critical care or die, which is Fortunate, but actually there is a, 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 you know, it's common, long COVID is common. There's a chance, as I said, you know, at least one in 10 and actually one in five for symptoms lasting more than five weeks that you won't be able to go back to your normal daily activity. Um, and you will be having these strange symptoms that people, you know, are not being able to, you know, largely explain at the moment. Uh, you won't be, you know, if you have caring responsibilities, it's, it's really, um, it's really painful. I mean, uh, I, I have three children and, um, you know, I managed to care for them, but obviously not in the way that, you know, I, I would when I, you know, what, before I, I had the infection. And, um, and I think, and, and if you have, depending on what work you have, you know, it's, it, it, is, it is a disability. And I think uh, this message is not coming through yet. Um, um, and, and it needs to definitely, it definitely at this stage. Professor Altman. Yeah, no, I'd endorse that. I think it's such a really key point where we so need to reach out to people like yourselves to, to get the right message out. Because, you know, at the moment, we're talking about the NHS at breaking point and the assault on the break on, on the NHS. 
with a sense that if only we can get through these dark days of January and February, everything will be okay. But everything really won't be okay because, um, you know, if we're talking about, you know, I gave the analogy of the situation in Brazil where the healthcare service has been almost broken by chronic disease following viral infection. Um, you know, I'm normally quite an optimistic person, but I feel very bleak about this, that if we've got hundreds of thousands of extra patients in clinics in the NHS for the next one or two or five or 10 years, that has implications for you lot, um, for policy, for healthcare provision, for taxation, for employment law. You know, that's, you know, that's really the ball in your court on a grand scale um, with really serious issues. So let's get the message out that we can't take this lightly and it doesn't matter whether you think you're low risk and might not die from this infection. Um, you know, there's, there's other risks out there as well. And certainly the public health me message has been save your granny. Um, and we do know that children are now potentially sufferers of long COVID. So there is maybe scope to discuss how we widen that public health message to potentially also protect the future of your children. Dr. Yeah, Alvin, you know, sorry. Not, yeah. Dr. Alvin. Okay, yes, absolutely, I agree. I mean, actually, we say that long COVID has been neglected. We don't know much about it. We don't know almost anything really about long COVID in children and the, you know, long, long, you know, any potential long term effects. And I think we need to be cautious um, about this. Um, and and um, rather than say, you know, that's fine, you know, they can they can get it and and, and nothing happens to them. That that you know, we we we. The, the approach really she needs to be precautionary, but definitely in terms of also uh, surveillance and measuring and research, we need to um, quantify this problem in children. That's been well, very, uh, uh, Professor Altman. Yeah, sorry, one detail to add to that. You know, that. I think, sure, we've known all the way through that it can affect people at all ages and the long COVID groups contain children and teenagers. But my sense, and there's not much data on this yet, but, yet, but my sense is that with the new mutation being around, particularly in the UK, the B1.1.7 mutation, um, colleagues are talking about hospitalizing whole families, um, you know, grandparents, parents, and children, and it being much more across the age spectrum and much less a disease of old people. Um, so however much that message was crucial before, it's 10 times more so now, because it really has somehow seemed to, seem to be morphing into the disease of all age groups. Wow, that's a very grim note to end on, Caroline. Thanks, Tracy. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm going to come to Barbara Keeley now. Thank you, and uh, thank you for all your evidence today. It's been, it's been very worthwhile. Um, the final question, really, just a wrap-up question, but perhaps most important in terms of what we might take forward in our uh, reports and recommendations. What do you feel is urgently needed now to support and treat those with long COVID? What are the most urgent things that uh, need to be done? Dr. Owen, if we start with you. So, um, I, as the, the urgent things I think um, in terms of the population, um, number one is we need to have our surveillance system. And I'm not just talking about research, I'm talking about normal surveillance system that is reporting to us, that's basically reporting us the numbers of the infection and the deaths, and that is determining policy, basically. But nothing around morbidity is determining policy at the moment because we don't have that sort of surveillance and, and the numbers. Um, so that needs to happen um, on a population level. Also on a population level, we need to have get the public health messaging right. Um, it's not about scaring people, it's about telling them, you know, this is happening and then telling them these are the, uh, you know, measures that could prevent um, this happening. Um, so, so, so these two things. On a patient level, um, I think the, 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 the stage is really, as, as I said, is recognition and uh, giving the patient uh, the diagnosis, uh, giving them, you know, listening to them, listening to their stories, um, having uh, good, you know, evolving case definitions, um, which take into account people who haven't got that lab evidence, whether it's a, you know, a PCR test of the infection or an antibody test, because we now, you know, we know very much the limitations around all of these uh, lab tests and the problems accessing them, uh, mm -hmm. you know, um, and the incentives around access. So I think, to, you know, regardless, we need those case definition. And then once you have um, the case definition, uh, listening to uh, the, the, the issues, um, doing a proper clinical assessment, uh, and then having the proper investigations 
uh, that are needed, particularly in the, in, the, in the first instance, to rule out anything that we know how to treat uh, because uh, COVID is predisposing people um, to lots of things. And I just want to throw in a statistics because I don't think it was mentioned widely before, another ONS uh, statistics really, where they compared people who um, uh, ha have been discharged from the hospital with COVID and, 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 and some of them not in critical care, so uh, not went into ICU, just went into hospital and then some controls. And they found that actually the incidence of things like diabetes and cardiovascular disease and chronic kidney disease and chronic liver disease is so much higher, uh, you know. So for example, with diabetes, you know, they found 131 um, in a thousand patient years have that in the discharged COVID patient as opposed to 15 uh, per hundred uh, per thousand uh, patient years in, in the control group and, this, and the similar with cardiovascular disease. So these are underlying pro problems developing, uh, you know, pot potentially because of the infection and they need to be picked up. So that's the investigation and then treating these, um, treating these uh, conditions uh, promptly because we know how to treat them. And then what we don't know how to treat uh, we, we need to basically, you know, we have the long COVID clinics, we have to learn basic how, how to do it. There are, you know, approaches, rehabilitation approaches, if they're appropriate, and if these are conditions that, you know, um, serious conditions can be excluded, that could we could we could try. Um, and, and I think the research will tell us more about that. But, uh, but basically, that's, these are the stages. Thank you. And Professor Altman? Yeah, well, you know, as, as a medical researcher, I'm sort of contractually bound to add to those points. Uh, you know that we have to have to understand the pathophysiology what's going wrong what are the mechanisms so that instead of offering people sort of platitudes or symptomatic treatment we can work out what to properly do for them so they can have their old lives back um, and I think that's doable and we have the will to do it and just you know take this on really seriously so that we know you know it's great to have long COVID clinics but we need to know what to do for people once they're in them Okay, thank you. Thanks, thanks both. Back to you, Chair. Thank you. So we are almost out of time, and I just wanted to put one last question, um, which is a potentially quite a big question, but it just came out of what you just said, actually, Professor Altman, really about people who've been living previously very healthy lives and suddenly um, their lives changing actually very, very quickly, and also at a time when there's so much isolation. And I just wondered if you could just finish by saying a few words maybe about what you're aware of in terms of the mental health impacts of how this is striking people because it must be just so difficult right now. Maybe Professor Altman first. Well uh, uh, let's, let's go to Dr. Alwyn first because again okay. she, she's, she's, she's been living and breathing this for a year now. <laughs> Thank you, thanks Danny. Uh, so I, I think huge, the mental health problem is huge. Um, um, there is the mental health burden of having a condition, being very anxious about having it, not knowing where you will end up, whether you'll get better, not, not getting the recognition. Um, so therefore, you know, that creates a lot of anxiety. Um, but also we, we, we're we seeing uh, now the pattern is there are people with, um, you know, um, symptoms developing. So there are cognitive uh, symptoms developing, you know, there are, you know, so, you know, neuropsychiatric symptoms developing, you know, a, 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 a wide range. Uh, so something, um, you know, triggered by the illness itself. Um, so I think the burden, um, the mental health um, burden is, is, is huge, really. And we, and we need to kind of, um, we need at least to relieve that, um, the mental health caused by, you know, not getting adequate recognition, not getting, not being able to, uh, you know, take time off work and, you know, you know, to, you know, be, be off sick or, and, and try and recover properly, uh, you know, having adequate care. And we need to probably look at the mechanisms and potential treatment for, you know, the, the, uh, the issues, you know, caused by the infection. Thank you. Did you want to add anything, Professor? No, nothing I could possibly add to that. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a biggie and it needs attention. Thank you so much. And in particular, Dr. Owen, we wish you very, very well in the future and hope for a, a speedy recovery. I mean, the, the evidence that you've both given us has been so powerful. And just looking at the chat, I know that many of our colleagues have found it incredibly powerful and, and, and very, very helpful as well. So we'll do our very best to reflect uh, the considerations that you put before us uh, with other colleagues and, and with ministers and government. So thank you again so much. And thank you to all of my fellow panelists for this session. And now I will bring it to a close. So thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.